Well, good afternoon to this Bickle webinar on virtual justice, remote hearings and trials. A great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar and delighted to be running with this with our friends at the International Association of Defence Council and the Paris Bar Commission on Paris Long. We'll be looking at this theme from a comparative perspective and we have three teams, US, UK and France. In the US, we've got Trip Haston, Amy Sherry Fisher and Andrew Chamberlain, three leading US attorneys, and also respectively former president, current president, and president-elect of the IADC. Um, from France, we have Jacques Brousseau and Elodie Vallette, who are two uh, French lawyers. And we're delighted also to welcome two judges, Patrick Coupeau, and Judge Christian Wiest from the Paris Commercial Court. And from the UK, we have uh, Judge, Mrs. Justice Cockerill uh, from Gillette and Alex uh, Valkov from Stewart's UK solicitors. Simon Ellis, also a solicitor from Hugh James in the UK and Ian Denham, a barrister from Outer Temple Chambers. Now in terms of the structure of this event, what we try to do is rather than just sort of doing a uh, jurisdiction of one jurisdiction after the other. We try to integrate it again as we've done in the past. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with just a little overview of each system, how the how that is dealt with, those systems have dealt with remote um, hearings and trials over the past few months. Then we're going to look at ex the experience and challenges and work through a series of challenges, technology, evidence, public access, etc. And then at the end, we're going to uh, look into the crystal ball, as it were, and try and work out what does this mean? What's happened over the last few months? What does it mean about the delivery of justice going ahead? Will things revert back or will things remain? Uh, will, will things um, change uh, given the experience you've just been through? Final point is feel free um, as attendees, please do drop us your questions. You can use the Q&A function, which you see on the bottom of your screen. And myself and Solène, uh, the tutor who is co-moderating this uh, event with me, myself and Solène will look at those questions and uh, pose them as a 10 minutes at the end when we can address those for you. So without further ado, um, let's start the webinar. So the first, um, the first topic is status and overview of remote hearings and trials, an overview of how the three legal systems have dealt with this issue. And we start off with the UK, uh, with Fiona um, starting, and then Mrs Justice Cockrell will say a word on this team. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you, Duncan, and welcome everyone. So I just wanted to set the scene a bit of what's, uh, what the position was in England. Um, and as some of you may already know, um, uh, the English civil courts already have had for a long time quite extensive case management powers, which did provide that um, the court can hold hearings and receive evidence by telephone or by using any other method of direct oral communication, and that witnesses can also give evidence to the court from a re remote location, usually abroad, via video link. Then, of course, comes 2020 and COVID-19. So what then happened is obviously by mid-March and very aware of the magnitude that coronavirus and its potential impact would have on the continued administration of justice, our Lord Chief Justice issued uh, his first update on the subject in which he said that it was of vital importance to the administration of justice that it did not grind to a halt. And he said that given the rapidly evolving situation, there was an urgent need to increase the use of telephone and video technology immediately to hold remote hearings where possible. A mere two days later, in a message to judges uh, in the civil and family courts, he stated that that should now be the default position, that hearings should be conducted with one, more than one, or all participants attending remotely, acknowledging, of course, however, that, ma that may not always be possible for all hearings. And then only a few days later, on the 23rd of March, our Prime Minister instituted what has become known in England as the National Lockdown, requiring all persons to stay at home, save for very limited purposes. This resulted in emergency legislation being, being enacted the Coronavirus Act 2020, 
which dealt with a, a number of aspects of uh, UK life, but insofar as it concerned the continuation of court business, it was completely consistent with our Lord Chief Justice's earlier guidance. And it basically made various amendments to uh, various acts or permitted various amendments to various acts, including the broadcasting of proceedings that were conducted wholly by video or by telephone. And, and I'll come back to that later on in the webinar about what broadcasting means in that context. And off the back of this emergency legislation, there then followed various protocols, various guidance were issued, various changes were made to our civil procedure rules that govern uh, court hearings and court procedures. And the result of all of that is that basically the English courts have embraced the challenge posed by remote working. And it, I, in my humble opinion, they've certainly defied the odds to ensure the continued administration of justice where possible. Um, it's very much, uh, and we'll hear from Mrs. Justice Cockrell in, in a minute from, with her view from, from the judiciary, but um, it's very much business as usual for, for the most part in the English civil courts with the majority of hearings taking place. Um, just to, to give you a, a few st st statistics before I hand over to Mrs. Justice Cockrell. Um, in the two week period from the 7th of April to the 24th of April, so at the height of our lockdown, between 85 and 90% of court hearings in the civil courts were held remotely. One third of those were held by video hearings and two thirds as telephone hearings. The highest recorded fig figure for a single day for audio hearings was approximately 3,400 hearings on the 8th of April. And for the use of video technology, the number of video hearings increased from 750 hearings in the final week of March, which was our first week of lockdown, to around 1,250 video hearings held on the 24th of April. And with that, I'll just hand over to Mrs. Justice Cockrell. So I'll just say very briefly, um, it has been absolutely remarkable how the courts have managed to deal with this. I sit primarily in the commercial court, but I also sit in the administrative court and various other courts. For us in the commercial court, of course, we have a very sophisticated clientele and moving to remote hearings for them has not proved at all problematic. So our figures are even better than the 85 to 90% that Fiona says. We've only adjourned four cases since lockdown owing to COVID. And those were things, cases which had very specific reasons, such as somebody actually having COVID or somebody being in lockdown in a place with no Wi-Fi. And those cases are now starting to get uh, rescheduled. Um, but the area where it's been really remarkable is in some of the other courts where there are a lot of litigants in person or there are solicitors who aren't as sophisticated. And the fact that that has managed to be um, as good as up to 85% has been remarkable. We've had a wide variety, of course, of hearings where there are litigants in person with no access to computers sometimes. There have been part phone, part um, computer, uh, Skype for business type hearings um, where we're dealing with business and property courts cases. Then often we've had very sophisticated setups. Most of our hearings, the normal ones, have been done by Skype for Business, but we've had a whole variety of much more sophisticated setups as well. But it's enabled us to ensure that pretty much everything has gone ahead. Obviously, in the criminal courts, things have been rather different because jury trials have had to basically be stopped until just now, when some of our jury trials are coming back in a socially distanced fashion in the larger courts. Thank you very much. Um, over to the other side of the Atlantic trip. Can you tell us about what's happening stateside? Thank you, Duncan, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, having us participate in this. Well, if you've been watching the news uh, to see what's been happening in the States, you'll know that we're suffering through the pandemic, just like our friends in France and the UK as well. Our systems are being tested here as they're being tested everywhere. And our systems are evolving and they'll continue to evolve, I think, to meet the needs and the challenges that we're all facing. Um, if you know anything about the system in the US, in the broadest of strokes, we have two fairly independent court systems, our federal system, that is our national system, and our state system that goes by each independent state court system. Um, there is coordination happening, uh, but given the broad diversity and the broad spread of the systems, it's not uniform in terms of its coordination and what's happening. In the federal system alone, there are roughly 100 separate federal uh, judicial districts, uh, different courthouses, more courthouses than districts. 
and almost 700 um, U.S. federal judges. In each of those places, there is some coordination, but a lot of independence on what individual judges are doing in their individual courts. And in the state system, it's even, uh, the numbers are much broader. There are roughly 1,800 courts of general jurisdiction throughout the country in the state system, and more than 10,000 uh, trial judges. In most, if not all states, um, there have been general orders entered about the manner in which uh, proceedings are to uh, go forward in terms of how to protect participants in the program, what's going to happen with jury pools, jury venires, jury trials, what's going to happen with um, individual trials. And so, you know, in terms of the topic for today, and just one other note, um, you know, we're very litigious over here on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, we, we love our court system and we love to be participants in the court system. Um, by one measure that I've seen since March the 1st, there have been more than 100,000 cases filed just in the federal system, and that's not counting the state system at loan. So the system has uh, enormous burdens on it, and if it doesn't process those cases, that it's going to cause a huge problem. So courts and judges are trying to come up with best practices to try to deliver justice without compromise due to the changing situations uh, that we have and not being able to do it the traditional way. So in the broadest of strokes, this is what I would say is happening here. There's quite a bit that's happening. And um, in the federal system, the Federal Judicial Center, which is, I'm sorry, the Federal Judicial Conference, which is the coordinating body for the federal court system, has authorized individual federal courts to allow video and telephone conferences for certain types of criminal procedures and hearings, including arrangement, arraignments and others. Um, the US Supreme Court, and this is quite historic, has also allowed arguments by telephone conference. That's never happened before in the history of the court. Um, and then when you get to sort of the trial level, the broadest of strokes are these. There are very, very few jury trials that are happening for obvious reasons, pulling people together in one confined space uh, for an extended period of time makes no public health sense right now. There's been at least one uh, advisory jury trial in a state court that we'll talk about in details as we move further into the program. But there are no grand juries that are happening right now that uh, is an important part of our criminal justice system. Hearings are happening everywhere. I've participated in several. I know Amy and Andrew have as well. Those are becoming very routine. And I think that that will be a lasting legacy here. I think we'll see a lot more courts being very comfortable with virtual hearings. There have been also a number of trials that have proceeded without juries. So these, in our language here, we'd call them bench trials. These are judge administered trials. And a number of those have happened. We'll speak about a few of those in, in a few more minutes. And I think, again, you'll see a lot more of that happening. Um, and then, of course, in the appellate courts, as I've mentioned, the U.S. Supreme Court has started telephone hearings, uh, uh, arguments, and a number of federal uh, circuit courts, appellate courts, have adopted that for, uh, process as well. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trip, for that overview. Really, really interesting. Um, so over to, over to France, um, Elodie and I think Jacques to tell us about what's happening in, in France, in Paris. Elodie. Yes, thank you, Duncan. Um, so uh, as Fiona and Tripp just said, we all agree on the fact that the, the outbreak of COVID-19 has created a substantial disruption and uncertainty with respect to managing civil litigation, whether they relate to ongoing proceedings or proceedings to be initiated. While in France, from March 16 until recently, uh, the courts have ceased all activity ex except for what they called essential litigation and emergency proceedings. Uh, further to the state of health emergency declaration on uh, March the 22nd, several orders were issued by the French government on March the 25th. And one in particular aims to adapt the proceeding rules. As you all know, uh, hearings are the most problematic phases during the COVID-19 crisis because of the risk of contamination. So the order I just mentioned uh, provides for several measures to reduce this risk. Uh, as we all observe, the vast majority of civil hearings have been postponed, halting personalities, or even have been rescheduled. 
Also, the possibility for the French courts to hold their hearings by remote hearing have been introduced, which is why I interest us quite in particular today. According to the French order, the judge may decide that the hearing will be held using an audiovisual telecommunication means, or in the event of a technical or material issues or impossibility of using such means, the judge may decide to hear the parties and their lawyers by any means of electronic communication, including, and the, uh, the order precise, uh, telephone. Uh, so what we can say is that the fundamental pr uh, principle of justice may, must be crucially uh, respected, which means that the judge, uh, without the presence of his office clerk, uh, must in fact ensure during this uh, remote hearing um, the identity of the parties, the respect of the right of the defense by the presence in particular of the parties themselves, the parties themselves, a time, uh, a time of debate for each party, or even the presence of an interpreter if, uh, if needed in the case of a foreign party. And of course, the quality of the transmission as well as the confidentiality of the exchanges between the parties and their lawyers. So of course, and we'll talk about that later on, remote hearing process uh, raises many questions about the modalities of its implementation and the process of personal data that it entails. Thank you, Elodie. Uh, Jacques, briefly, do you want to tell us a bit about what's happening yes. in, in practice in the, the Paris Commercial Court? Yeah, thank you very much, Duncan. Very briefly, because Elodie has already provided you with a very complete uh, view of the French, uh, French situation. Uh, first, uh, a comment we share with our uh, English friends and neighbors, uh, which is uh, the European Convention on uh, Human Rights. Um, the current situation in France uh, is a derogation to Article 6.1 uh, of the, the Convention that provides that uh, anyone is, in, is, in, is entitled to a, a fair and public hearing, uh, which means uh, that uh, in a short period of time this will be over um, because we are under uh, a derogation to the Convention. Uh, we have to keep it in mind when we we'll, uh, think about what we can keep of all these uh, use of uh, platforms and uh, artificial intelligence in, in, the, in the judiciary. And my second comment uh, for all our English and American friends uh, would be just to, uh, to explain to you uh, that you will hear two uh, very famous judges of the Commercial Court of Paris. Uh, in France, we have the, the great chance of uh, having a commercial court, which is a very long-standing uh, court um, with a very uh, sophisticated knowledge of the business life, uh, because our judges are, are coming from the, the, the business life. Uh, our judges are elected by their peers, and they know very well the, um, the specificities of the business life and the and the, the, the needs of our clients. Uh, so uh, when Elodie or I or, or Judge Vlist and Judge Coupeau will speak about commercial court or, or civil court, it means that we have different courts for civil matters. Uh, for instance, that's the tribunal judiciaire, uh, whilst for commercial matters, that's the commercial court. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thank you very much, Jack. Some interesting points that to what extent is a remote hearing a public hearing? We'll talk about that later on, no doubt. Um, over to, let me hand over to Solen. Thank you, Solen. You need to you unmute, Solen, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Um, now we are going to look at the experience to date of virtual hearings and the challenges posed by the remote justice. So our panelists from the UK, France and the US will first let us know with a more specific way what type of cases are remotely heard in their jurisdictions. Are they mostly commercial, mostly civil? So, and then we'll move on on technology. What is the technology used in those remote hearings? How do they impact on equality of arms? access to justice, fair trial, 
And then we'll look at how can a virtual hearing be accessible to the public? Can we open the door of a virtual courtroom as we do in normal tribunal? And finally, we'll look at the evidential issues um, and how they are dealt with in virtual hearings. Is cross-examination possible? How are the documents used? Um, is there any impact on advocacy? So we will also discuss as to how a trial made of emotions of good or bad impressions, flesh and blood, and effet de manche that we say in, France, in French, how can this be transposed through computers? So we'll, we'll start with the types of cases which are specifically heard um, in the UK, and I, I will hear about, we'll, we'll hear Simon, Simon and Mrs. Justice Cockrell. Good afternoon, and thank you for that. Um, I think it's fair to say, as was commented earlier on, um, that for the courts in England and Wales, it's very much been business as usual, uh, and a great effort has been made to carry on wherever possible. Um, there's been a slight difference in the UK as to the extent to which that's been possible for individual types of cases. As always was mentioned earlier, uh, I think it's fair to say that the commercial uh, cases have perhaps been easier to deal with remotely, uh, in part uh, because the parties are often more used to dealing with witness evidence uh, and testimony remotely, particularly where there's an international element to that, and also as the parties are often much more familiar with the litigation process. Um, I think there can be a slightly different picture, certainly in the shorter term, for um, personal injury cases uh, and in the context of the cases I predominantly deal with, which are noise-induced hearing loss, um, for slightly obvious reasons. Um, some of the clients that I have um, often have a difficulty uh, in hearing properly what is going on, if there's any interference on the line or the connection is poor. Uh, and as they can be less sophisticated in terms of their familiarity with the court process, that can impact upon their ability to follow and engage with the trial remotely. Now, the position is slightly different when it comes to case management hearings, um, and I think these have uh, largely transitioned fairly seamlessly um, to uh, a remote setting. Um, and there's often use of facilities like Microsoft Teams or they're held with by telephone, and the parties broadly have adapted very well to this. Um, certainly in the hearings that I've been involved with, um, the parties have been uh, represented by experienced uh, and well-resourced firms and council have also had access to that and that has certainly smoothed the transition process. I think it's also resulted in a more pragmatic approach being taken in some cases, um, certainly in the directions hearings that we've been involved with where a great deal of agreement has often been achieved in advance of the hearing. Um, I think the need for the remote hearings has been to a large extent. Um, perhaps the the main issue that has, uh, we've encountered on these cases so far has been to do with the internet strength, uh, which has been intermittent, and the technology has occasionally let us down. Um, that has been, I'd say, an annoyance at this point in time, rather than fatal to these cases, um, but it has been much easier to address in the context of a directions hearing where the parties uh, are experienced legal representatives and the court, um, and I think that has been uh, quite an important factor. Certainly the feedback that we've had from counsel who've been involved in remote trials, and these have been up to four days in length, is that they have worked quite well where the technology has operated well, often with a mixture of hard copies and electronic models. And it's interesting just to compare the position to uh, experience that we've had pre-COVID uh, in one particular case that comes to mind of um, a, a medical expert who himself suffered with quite profound hearing problems and who had to give his evidence by a video link from the US. Now, that worked reasonably well, to be fair. Uh, there were occasionally issues with time delay on the connection, but the actual experience worked quite well. I think it remains to be seen whether that would have been as effective with numerous parties, uh, particularly where we have individuals who are less familiar with the court process. Uh, but the experience there was quite positive and certainly bodes well for the future. Thank you, Simon. Mrs. Mrs. Justice Cockrell, would you like yes, to... I'll just say very briefly, um, I basically endorse what, what Simon has had to say. Um, we have had all sorts of hearings taking place uh, remotely, apart really from jury trials or things like that. So we've had um, full trials with witnesses from all around the world or just from within this country. 
Um, those witness actions have included the kinds of things that one might have thought twice about having any remote evidence in the past. For example, when the issues of fraud, when you're obviously very keen to be able to assess a witness's evidence. Uh, case management hearings, appeals, preliminary issues, enforcement hearings, all of those have gone ahead. Uh, the, the two exceptions to um, cases which have gone ahead remotely have been committals. So when somebody has breached a court order and is effectively being uh, sent, potentially sent to prison, those have still been where the um, alleged contemnor is going to be there, um, have been taking place in court so that they can then be taken to prison if necessary. And once or twice we've had cases where a passage of evidence has been taken live with very limited people within the courtroom. And we're now moving to what we call hybrid hearings, where the bits which are best suited to being heard within a courtroom are heard live with maybe a limited attendance and the rest remote or with parties linked remotely. And so that really covers just about everything. Thank you very much. Um, what about the US trip? Trip. Trip is yes. trip. <laughs> Mark, I'm sorry. I would say that our experience is very similar to uh, what this is Justice Cockrell and Simon have laid out in the UK in that in terms of hearings, those hearings are moving forward. The less complicated the hearing, the more likely they are to be held by video conference. I've had a number of different hearings and I know Andrew and Amy have as well that are all pre-trial related on motions and status conferences. Um, and then in terms of bench trials, there've been a number of bench trials here in the US um, that I'll go into a little bit of detail about. The one exception uh, that we, we're not having here, and I don't expect we'll have anytime soon, are jury trials. That affects criminal justice much more substantially ultimately than it will affect civil justice. It's one thing for the parties in a civil private dispute to have to wait. It's another for a criminal defendant to have to wait. And so that's going to be a real tricky issue that we're going to have to work through. Um, in the U.S., we're only really aware of a single jury trial that's proceeded, and it, it was a very unique setting. It was in a Texas state court. Texas has a unique procedure called a summary trial. It's really a method to try to get the party's information to consider um, resolution uh, through a non-binding jury trial. It's a one-day proceeding, limited number of exhibits. Jurors were selected, uh, 25 were called, they were selected down to 12, so there were uh, 13 were released. This was all done online um, in a suburban Dallas, Texas court. Um, and, by, and it was not a terribly complicated proceeding, it was an insurance dispute. So very focused issue, number, a limited number of witnesses, limit, limited number of exhibits, and ultimately a non-binding sort of procedure. But I think uh, from all the reviews um, uh, in terms of the process, I think the participants were pleasantly surprised with how well things worked, uh, how well the technology worked, um, how the jurors were actually able to confer with each other. And in this unique setting, they split the jury into six, a group of six in separate sort of virtual rooms to be able to um, deliberate. Um, there, in the U.S., we also do a number of things, um, including mock jury trials. And there have been a number of mock jury trials for more than at least a year that have been done virtually. And people who have participated in those, and I'm one, I think uh, have been skeptical about whether the technology will work, whether you're going to get a representative jury or not. And by and large, those concerns have been overcome. It's a completely different issue, though, I think, when you come to a full-blown binding jury trial because of limitations of being able to make uh, witness credibility decisions and choices and judgments, being able to effectively cross-examine witnesses uh, with documents, with a jury there. That's going to be a big question, I think, and there'll be lots of uh, study, commentary, debate uh, around those issues. In terms of bench trials, again, um, we know that they're happening all over the country, both in federal and state court. Um, uh, they, there have been patent trials that have proceeded in Virginia federal court. Um, there have been voting rights trials that have proceeded in uh, Florida federal courts. Um, there have been a, a, at least um, 
uh, several property dispute cases. And so again, I think the less complicated the case, um, the more finite the number of exhibits and witnesses, the more likely we're gonna be able to move those cases ahead by consent with the court's backing. Um, I think the concerns, as I've mentioned, that will remain will be, how do you effectively cross-examine witnesses um, with exhibits, particularly in terms of a jury trial, as well as uh, just logistics that go with ensuring reliable technology, reliable access uh, for all the participants, and finally, security issues as well. And I think Andrew will talk to you on that in a minute. Yeah, Thank that's you. right. Thank you very much, Tripp. So what about France? Mr. Christian Vist, who, who is who are a judge at the, at the International Chamber of the Paris um, Commercial Court. What is your experience? Right, thank you very much. Um, in France, the lockdown happened on March 15th and our court closed on that day. And um, we had to wait 10 days before the uh, government uh, ordinance was passed and allowed us to use the video conference systems or telephone conferences it was not allowed before. And uh, our deliberations by phone were also allowed, which was not the case so much before. The thing is that uh, we, we have two types of hearings. We have the case management hearings and the pleading hearings. And uh, we do case management hearings. As, well, we, have, uh, uh, we, we deal with 200 cases in two hours. Um, quickly and obviously the video conference is not at all adapted for that. So we had to drop that type of case management hearings, but the, the pleading hearings were quite uh, all right. And um, uh, we, we, um, we, we found the same way as uh, I heard from the UK and the US colleagues that uh, a video conference is totally suitable for hearings. Obviously the more simple they are, the better. But um, I would say that um, um, as, as it was mentioned, um, we, the judges in this court, we all come from uh, the business world and we've used uh, video conferences extensively during our business life before. So we got familiar, we're quite familiar with the video conference. It's not the case with the lawyers or counselors. And I hate to say the only challenges we found out at the beginning was the, the fact that uh, our um, counselors were not very well equipped and uh, we're not feeling familiar with the, feeling at ease with the video conference, but I have to say this has been corrected quite uh, quickly. And uh, uh, I've myself found that uh, a video conference is quite satisfactory for the pleading hearings. And uh, um, I would say that uh, I'd like this to go on. Unfortunately, we are told that the emergency state in France will stop on, uh, by mid August and it will not be allowed anymore to use, uh, to have our hearings uh, through video conference. Thank you. And what about Patrick, Mr. Patrick Coupeau? You're also a judge at the commercial court dealing with insolvency proceedings. Yes, you? thank you very much. Uh, Christian talked about uh, general litigations and I will talk about uh, insolvency procedures. Uh, as Christian said, we were allowed to use uh, video conference only the 25th of March. And the time to adapt, we started to have remote hearings uh, only the 1st of April. And uh, at the beginning, we, we have chosen to hold uh, the urgent insolvency cases, like a request for opening of safeguard or a receivership or liquidation uh, judicial liquidation and uh, after a few time we decide also to hold hearings about uh, backup plans or recovery plans or disposal plans. And for all these hearings in France we need uh, three judges and the presence of the public prosecutor and also obviously a court clerk. Uh, these hearings are not public, there are totally confidential. Uh, we hold them in what we call Chambre du Conseil, maybe in English it's something like Council Chamber, uh, with a limited number of attendants. So uh, there are quite adapted, remote hearing is quite adapted for this type of uh, confidential hearings. Uh, our challenge was to anticipate 
the adequate time for each hearing, each case, and to launch the invitation at the right time. So we had to, to be sure that uh, the president of the hearing will not go on with uh, additional time or to, be, to speak too long. As that was the case also, uh, the respect of the agenda uh, to have the party not, not too, uh, talking too much. That was quite a, a challenge. Uh, after a few weeks, we discovered that uh, this hearing was working very well and we extend them to the hearings by the judge commissioner, which are small hearings and also very adapted to this type of uh, remote hearings. So in the, in the Paris court, Paris commercial court, uh, within two months, we hold 351 remote hearings and uh, it allows us to not to have any delay and uh, to finish the, these two months of uh, uh, special period with, with a reasonable stock of offers, which is quite uh, satisfactory. And as Christian said, unfortunately, we will stop this type of remote hearings the 10th of August because the government did not decide to allow us to go on. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Elodie, Elodie Vallette, who you are a lawyer at Whiten Case, would you add anything? Um, yes, please. Thank you, Solène. Um, well, during the, the COVID-19 crisis, I had to deal with a, a judgment rendered just a few weeks before the lockdown uh, in the context of a serial litigation. So to make it worse, such a decision was rendered with provisional enforcement, uh, meaning that it could be enforced even though an appeal had been lodged. Uh, so in such case, it's pretty much uh, what we call a, a race against time uh, that starts. Why? Because on one hand, you may ask under summary proceedings, the first president of the Paris Court of Appeal uh, to suspend the provisional enforcement. However, on, uh, on the other hand, uh, such a summary proceedings does not prevent the enforcement of the judgment until the first president of the Court of Appeal orders otherwise. Well, in our case, we are ready to celebrate and we had been given a, a hearing date at the end of April so, of course, during lockdown. So given the, the COVID-19 crisis, the office clerk let us know that such a hearing could not take place. So there were some discussions as to whether this hearing could be held via remote hearing. And this option was soon ruled out in view of the number of parties involved and of many technical issues. So at the time, I found it quite odd, quite odd even though understandable, uh, that such an essential litigation could not uh, be held before the, the Paris Court of, of Appeal uh, via um, remote hearing, essentially because it relates to a uh, to serial litigation, to a class action sort of. That's the experience I'd like to, to share. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, now we are going to look at the technology that is used uh, during uh, virtual hearings, as it is obviously a very important uh, matter in virtual hearings. Um, so obviously it starts with a very with a good internet connection I would say this is a very this is a, the very start but it also encounters multiple other issues which must be resolved in order to allow a smooth and well-organized hearing if it's possible. Um, I will I'll pass on, um, I'll ask Trip to tell us about the US experience and what, what technology is used generally, if there is a general uh, use of technology in the US. I, I actually think Andrew will take that up. Uh, oh, first. sorry. Yeah, sorry, uh, Andrew. Sorry. My well, well, thank, Andrew. thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to begin by observing that the legal industry, whether it is in the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, or France, is a traditional industry. Uh, it tends to, uh, although it has adopted a great deal of technology in the last 10 to 15 years, it generally lags behind uh, the business community in the adoption of technology. We are all products of our uh, tradition and are uh, following 
uh, years of, of guidance from our predecessors. Uh, so uh, the adoption of technology into the legal community has, has tended to be um, either business oriented uh, or adapted to the application of the business of the practice of law rather than in anticipation that we would have virtual hearings and virtual trials. So uh, as, as we all know, crisis brings change. And our courts in the United States have been adapting to that change uh, through a, a sort of patchwork uh, system of piecing together various pieces of technology that might be shared by those in the legal community. And so what we have seen most frequently is some combination of uh, the use of Zoom for hearings, uh, the use of YouTube to stream hearings so that you can have public access, uh, the use of Dropbox, for example, to uh, in, the, in the summary trial that, that Tripp mentioned earlier, the jurors had available to them a, a Dropbox in which the exhibits would be deposited and the jurors could review the exhibits in Dropbox uh, as their deliberations continue. But these are all technologies that were uh, developed for other purposes and were not crafted for the courtroom. So things like, for example, bench conferences, deliberations among jurors, uh, preserving the confidentiality of, of some documents as to others, uh, uh, those are not well developed in the current technology. Um, but as I said before, what we've seen is a patchwork. In addition to the technologies I've mentioned, we've also seen the use of Cisco Jabber, uh, of Microsoft Teams, of WebEx, uh, different types of technologies that have been employed. Uh, and generally that's been determined based on what's available to the court and the specific litigants. Uh, not everyone has Microsoft Teams, for example. Uh, but at, as this technology has come forward, you know, there are issues uh, related to uh, security and confidentiality. And we know, for example, that both Dropbox and Zoom have had security challenges in the past that they purport that they believe that they have addressed through password entry and to, to try to prevent Zoom bombing uh, where someone uninvited uh, uh, enters your meeting. Uh, and, and so as we proceed it forward in the future, we're going to have to see both uh, that security tightened and the ability to um, uh, segregate uh, confidential documents uh, from the public uh, domain while a, while a trial is going on that would be more readily handled if you were in the courtroom. Um, I, I think I'll take a break there because I, I have another assignment later. Yes, thank you very much, Andrew. So now on the UK experience, I let Alex talk about the various challenges you had to fight to 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 face recently alex valkov and this is justice cochrane will comment as well thank you Selene. greetings to everyone and thank you for joining us in the past three months i've come to think of COVID litigation technology if i could call it that way uh, as three separate categories video conferencing document delivery and public access in terms of video conferencing technology the English court has made uh, use of a number of different applications. At the moment, Skype for Business seems to be the most commonly used one. However, the main reason for that is more to do with the fact that it's pre-installed on judicial laptops. So uh, there, due to security concerns and restrictions that judicial laptops have on them, uh, that is by far the easiest application for our judges to use. My firm has a special script which we employ to monitor the High Court's uh, daily cause list. And according to our data, apart from Skype, the court has made use of the following, which is Microsoft Teams 94 times, Zoom 197 times, WebEx four times, Opus 2 23 times, and Spark approximately 52 times. 
I hasten to say, of course, that these are just rough figures rather than precise ones. Teams, Zoom, and WebEx are obviously standard video conferencing platforms with which most of you would be familiar with. Opus 2 is actually a provider. It offers a number of solutions, including e-bundling and live transcription services, which are widely used by litigators in England. So as far as I understand, they have now boasted their offering by integrating a user's preferred video conferencing facility into a special Opus 2 platform, which in essence allows for an all-in-one product. Uh, Spark provide event production services. Uh, they would use whichever video conferencing platform the parties have chosen, deploy it and provide technical support. In terms of the appellate courts, the Court of Appeal seems to be only using Skype for business, whereas it seems that the Supreme Court is, re is relying primarily on WebEx. In terms of document delivery technology, most courts now require a soft copy of the court bundle. Uh, in fact, the court, uh, apologies, HM Court and Tribunal Services Service pr recently produced general guidance on the requirements for PDF bundles, which can be found online. The guidance provides for, amongst others, page numbers and bookmarks, which should be um, achievable quite easily with specialized software, which deals with PDFs. For example, PDF docs is something we use. That said, it is also open for parties to uh, make use of e-bundle providers, such as Opus 2. And finally, in terms of uh, public access technology, there seems to be three solutions, which the courts are currently uh, using the first one is direct live stream to YouTube. This has now been implemented by the Court of Appeal. Now the benefit of doing this is obviously YouTube's infrastructure is a lot more capable of handling live streams with a large number of viewers um, than any, anything else really. Uh, it has also the ability to interface with a number of video conferencing platforms directly. Uh, and there are other, of course, alternative alternatives to YouTube, for example, Vimeo or Twitch TV. However, YouTube is more widely recognized by the general public. Now, as far as I understand, the Supreme Court has its own infrastructure and it has had that a long time ago. It's been implemented for a long time and it's been prior to the COVID crisis and it's continued to use that infrastructure to live stream directly to its website. And finally, you could also rent and set up your own infrastructure and stream proceedings on a created for that purpose website. We have some experience of doing that, but we found that the problem with it is definitely cost. The price goes up exponentially with the number of viewers that you have watching the platform. From a personal experience, never underestimate the amount of people who would be keen to watch proceedings online. In the beginning of lockdown, one of our cases amassed slightly more than 3000 views just over a few days. Thank you, Sulan. Thank you very much, Alex. Mrs. Justice Cockrell, what is your experience? Are you, are you using Zoom or you, I understand that you're, you, you're using another platform at the judiciary? Yes. So the um, default position for the judiciary is Skype for Business. That is, as Alex said, what is pre-installed on our judicial laptops and um, had passed the security clearance effectively. In terms of other providers, that it's a question of getting approval for the security side of it. So we are not supposed to use any other platform on our judicial laptops. However, a number of cases, people have chosen another platform and then arrangements are made. Uh, for us to use that platform. That may be by our using our own personal laptop. Um, so I'm speaking to you now from Zoom, because, through Zoom, because I'm on my iPad. Um, or so sometimes the judge is provided with a separate laptop with the platform of choice pre-installed. So that's how the range of platforms has been managed. Um, in terms of the platforms, Alex mentioned Opus. Um, Opus have most of their hearings thus far have incorporated WebEx, I think. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is we're getting this interesting question of interfacing two platforms during hearings. So for example, if you're in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division here, um, the actual hearing will take place between the judges and the parties on one platform. And then the judges are linked up on another platform um, which is the, um, the um, virtual platform, which we are going to be moving to soon overall. 
And at the same time you find in hearings, the court will be say in Skype for business, but quite often parties will have their side order of Zoom for their personal interactions. So rather than passing sticky notes or going into a meeting room, they will have a meeting room in Zoom and pass notes via a chat in Zoom. Um, and that is, that is quite interesting. Um, obviously, all of, all of these things do involve verifying in advance that people can participate. And these are all options which, again, have worked much more smoothly in the commercial and highly funded or sophisticated forms of litigation. When we're looking at cases in the administrative court, sometimes in the family court, where you have individual litigants, then sometimes getting access to the, the platform via Wi-Fi or via computer is just not on. And we've been having part uh, telephone, part uh, remote hearings. Um, all of this, of course, does involve preparation as well. And that has been one big thing in terms of the people we work with, our clerks, our administrators, as well as doing their own jobs that they'd always be doing. They're spending a huge amount of time liaising as to platforms and doing dress rehearsals because to make each hearing work well, you need at least one dress rehearsal. So every time I have a hearing, the day before my clerk will have linked up with all the parties to make sure that everything works. And sometimes she does extra hearings as well when people are uncertain and want an extra dry run. So it's, um, it's kind of like a swan. It looks great and elegant and effortless on the surface. And there's been an awful lot of hard paddling going on underneath the surface. Mm, very interesting. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mrs. Justice. So what about, what about France? Mr. Mr. Patrick Coupeau, judge at um, the um, Commercial Court of Paris. Yep, what is you. the technology that you are using? Uh, so first, in, uh, in Paris, we had absolutely no experience of uh, remote hearings before the COVID crisis. But we had already a platform to submit the case uh, to the court uh, through uh, what we call Tribunal Digital. Uh, which was very useful during the, the lockdown. Uh, when the government decided to allow uh, the audiovisual technology to hold earrings, uh, it was the 25th of March, uh, we immediately tried to find an uh, application, a uh, platform, which was uh, confidential, because, as I said before, our hearings in the insolvency case have to be totally confidential in, a, in this uh, chamber. So uh, we discussed with, uh, with the reg registry of the courts, and we finally chose a French platform called Tixeo, uh, which is a platform which, bring, which brings sorry, reliability and confidentiality. Uh, this version has been uh, chosen uh, among the questions, there was a question of the cost, but the cost is taken in charge by the registry of the court. And also the question of the number of people which were allowed to attend the hearings. And we choose um, uh, the platform with a maximum of 50 persons, which is quite enough in a, a type of, this is type of hearings. So we have made at the very beginning, we have made tests with the judges uh, to be sure about the quality of their equipment at home and to be sure about the quality of their internet connection. And uh, after we made some tests with uh, public prosecutors and also with the bankruptcy receivers and what we call in France the mandataire judiciaire. So all these persons were with correct equipment and correct connection. The difficulty with, was with the debitor companies, their lawyers, and uh, the representative of employees of the companies. And very often, we had a poor, poor quality of, uh, of connection and poor quality of equipment. And that have created many perturbations in the rings and a big lose, lose of time. But finally, uh, with a, a good management of the hearing, it made it possible. Uh, 
the point with uh, Tixeo, which is, I would say, a very specific platform, is that uh, this platform requests a reasonable bandwidth and also a connection good enough uh, to uh, face the, all the problem of uh, antivirus system and security. Uh, on also a problem of uh, organizing these uh, remote hearings was uh, to launch invitations uh, at the appropriate mail address to be sure that the party will load the application and so on. But as I said before, uh, it's uh, finally worked. Uh, this TXEO application has been chosen for the insolvency hearings, but it has been used also for the general litigation. And in general litigation and also in some hearings of our chambers, we have used Teams and Zoom, but it was quite marginal. Most of the hearings have been held by TXEO. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, that's very interesting. Um, I will pass it pass on to uh, Duncan, who will deal with the other. Uh, now we'll look deal with public access to justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, Jacques mentioned earlier on whether virtual hearings can be a public hearing. So we want to look now at the issue of public access, live streaming, etc. And so I'll hand straight over to Fiona, say a word. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to approach the, uh, this from the UK perspective. And um, uh, in, in the UK, in England and Wales, we, we do have um, a requirement of public access to justice, which means all hearings are public unless uh, a direction to the contrary is made. Um, so what, what is meant by a public hearing? Um, well, it means that members of the public obviously should have access to coming in and sitting in court and, and, and listening in on the proceedings. But one shouldn't forget that public access to court hearings is always going to be limited by the number of people who can physically be present in a courtroom. And so it's not an unlimited entitlement of any member of the public or all members of the public to come. When the courtroom is full, the courtroom is full and no one else can come in and that's the end of it. So if you really want to attend a hearing and it's a very, it's a high profile one and the media is very interested, they will be outside the courtroom really early trying to get their spots. Uh, it's a bit like putting your towel down uh, at the beach basically. Um, so, so with that kind of context of, you know, it's, it's public, hearings are public, but it's only public insofar as there's, there's enough capacity. Uh, the same system, in a sense, has been adopted uh, for remote hearings. And um, when the Coronavirus Act came in, um, some amendments were made to allow for broadcasting of, of hearings that are held wholly remotely, whether that's by video or by telephone. And, and certainly the protocol that followed uh, immediately, immediately after amendment to the legislation seemed to suggest that by broadcasting, what was intended was actually broadcasting the Zoom hearing, for example, into a, onto a screen in a, in a courtroom. Um, but obviously with, with lockdown, that's just not possible and social distancing. So um, as, as you've heard from Mrs. Justice Cockrell and, and uh, my colleague Alex, what's happened is that some hearings have been live streamed um, over the internet, whether that's uh, YouTube or otherwise. Um, and, and that's possible, but always with the permission of the trial judge. Judge. So for any form of broadcasting, it's still necessary to get a direction from the trial judge to allow, or, or from the hearing judge, to allow that to happen. Uh, and that's, that's one of the amendments that's been made to the rule. It's not automatic. You still have to get permission. Um, and certainly live streaming is not the norm at all. Uh, it's certainly, I think, as Alex uh, mentioned, um, and, and as was the case in, in the hearing he and I did, um, it, it was mainly done for the convenience of the parties. Uh, when there are lots of participants who want uh, to be able to follow and watch the proceedings, um, it makes sense to not take the risk of interference of having 100 people on a Zoom call. As we all know now, actually, you can hold events of hundreds of thousands, well, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds of people on Zoom, and there don't, does, doesn't seem to be much latency issues or whatever. Um, but uh, for a court hearing, which really absolutely has to run smoothly, probably the less participants who are active participants invited into the Zoom meeting, the better. And the live stream allows for any other number of people to follow that. 
Um, one thing to note is that even, broad, even though broadcasting is now permitted uh, under our legislation, it's still an offence for anyone other than the court um, to make or attempt to make an unauthorised recording or an unauthorised transmission. So if someone is publicly watching uh, a, a live stream on YouTube and they're recording it on their phone, that would be an offence. Um, and so that's just a, a reminder. Um, th there are a number of other ways though about in which the uh, public access to justice requirement can be met. And um, our, one of the changes to our civil procedure rules that came in in late March it actually provides that where a single member of or media representative is able to access proceedings remotely while they're taking place, they will be they will be public proceedings. So essentially you just need one media representative to be able to access the proceedings, to categorize those proceedings as public proceedings. And so what's happened um, is uh, in our, on, on our courts and tribunal services website, which lists every day for each court what hearings are taking place. If you look at that uh, online now, uh, public, publicly accessible, it will tell you, usually it will tell you which court the hearing is taking place in. Now it will tell you which method the hearing is taking place um, by, whether that's Zoom, um, WebEx, Teams, uh, Skype for Business, and there is then um, an email address which any member of the media or any member of the public can email and ask for access uh, to the remote hearing. And no doubt when they request that access and they're provided with it, they will be given strict instructions to be on mute with video off, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially that is how we are meeting in England uh, the public access to justice requirement. Um, there are other ways also of meeting it and uh, one that, that we um, implemented in our trial, which was the first trial to go ahead at the start of lockdown uh, fully remotely. And that was that we were directed by the trial judge to upload onto um, our firm's uh, webpage a, the daily transcript. We had transcribers transcribing every day and at the end of the day we get the, trans trans the full transcript of the hearing um, from the transcribers and we were directed to upload that onto our firm's website and again the cause list uh, directed anyone who was interested in seeing the transcript um, could access it via our website uh, and there was a link provided and again that is another way in which public access to justice uh, can be fulfilled as long as the, uh, the public has the opportunity to, um, to basically see what had happened during the proceedings and that can be done by reviewing the transcript um, that uh, satisfies, uh, satisfies that. And then I was just asked to also touch on what on, on the confidentiality of proceedings. Um, as I mentioned, all, by default, all hearings are public hearings. Um, however, uh, pre-pandemic, pre-broadcasting you know broadcasting of hearings, uh, it's always open to the parties to apply to the judge uh, to have the hearing heard in private. And that remains the case. And it can be, and a hearing can be fully in private or partly in private. If in, in, in that case, uh, for example, if there are parts of it that need to be heard in private only, in the same way as any media um, representatives or members of the public who would be sitting at the back of the court would be asked to leave the courtroom, uh, they would be asked to leave the, um, the, 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 the Zoom meeting or, or the, the um, uh, Teams meeting or whatever it would be. So, so that hasn't changed and that's how uh, any confidentiality issues can, can, can still be dealt with. And I'll, I'll just hand over to Mrs. Justice Cochran in case she has anything she wanted to add on that on those points. You're on mute, I'm afraid. You're on, you're on mute, Mrs. Justice Cockrell. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I have very, very little to add, just two things. Um, one is that one of the interesting things that we have found, or slightly disappointing things we've found, is that despite people being informed that it is illegal to take photographs uh, during a court hearing or to record it, there have been instances of doing that. And that is something which informs, to an extent, decisions as we are going forward now. Each case you have to think about what is the best way to ensure public access while bearing in mind that people do not always respect um, the sanctity of a court in the way they would if they were in it. Um, and then we get to interesting questions as well in relation to our hybrid hearings. Once you've got some parties in court, so counsel in court, um, should it be the case that you can then say, well, the public can come into court, so we don't need to do anything else for public access? And, and that is, I think, going to be an interesting question going forward, uh, where increasingly now having 
cases where either the public is welcomed back into court or where having a stream from the, the numbers limited courtroom to a separate courtroom for public access. Thank you very much. Um, over to the US. Amy, have you from your side of the Atlantic? Yes, thank you, Duncan, and uh, hello to everyone. I will tell you that I think I just had one of the things we all worry about when we're having these virtual proceedings, where my computer just shut down in the middle of uh, the previous uh, Fiona's uh, presentation, and I was madly trying to get it up on my iPhone and then back to my computer. Um, so that doesn't have anything to do with public access, but it is, a, I think, a problem with this, with these systems when the computers fail us. But in the United States, um, public access to the judicial system is a recognized right in our U.S. and most state constitutions. Um, despite that, not all our courts are up and running with it yet. There have been challenges by public interest groups. Uh, there was a court in California, state court in California, that was not allowing public access and it was challenged by a public interest group. As Andrew mentioned, I think the Southern District of Illinois, uh, which was one of our federal courts, has uh, issued orders, as have several other federal and state courts for public access. And it's essentially um, for this, to any proceeding that is in open court. So as we mentioned, confidentiality issues can close a courtroom. It can also close a Zoom room or a YouTube feed. Um, I know of a case that was held last week with a two-day hearing in Utah where public access was allowed, um, noted on the court docket, as Fiona also noted, and apparently the participants did not get words to not share their videos. So there were non-lawyers uh, doing things like eating and drinking and uh, generally misbehaving if they had been in, in open court uh, that everyone got to see. The United States uh, House of Representatives has introduced a bill, it's called the Court Access Amid Pandemic Act. Um, it was just introduced at the end of April and it's currently at the Judiciary Committee for review, but it requires that uh, the courts must live stream any hearing that is only uh, telephonic or by video. So um, at the rate um, government tends to work, it will probably come out of committee about the time the pandemic's over, uh, but at least it's something we're focusing on. So that's essentially the public interest access. It's very similar to uh, our friends in England. Thank you very much, Amy. Over to France. Monsieur Vis, would you like to say a word? Public access? Your mute. You need to unmute. Here we are. You hear me? All right. Um, yes, like in the US, in the UK, the the um, all hearings in France are public hearings for litigations, not not for insolvencies or obviously, and. Uh, <clears throat> Then we have a problem in case of virtual conference because um, in order to attend the, the hearing, you need to have a password, you need to have a number of meeting number. So it's not, it, we can't say that in case of video conference, the, the, the hearing is public. I have to say that uh, uh, live streaming is not an issue because uh, our commercial cases don't attract huge crowds and uh, we, we, don't, um, we don't need to, uh, to, to, to stream live uh, our, our hearings like that. But um, uh, there's one good thing with the video conference is that um, it allows parties from uh, we, who are uh, far away uh, to connect. I had a case myself where there was a US claimant against a Japanese defendant and both of them could connect the hearing easily, I would say, uh, using the Tixeo, which Patrick mentioned, Tixeo software platform. They could connect, attend the meeting. They all, both of them, were happy to save on travel costs. And uh, apparently, uh, after the, uh, we, we asked them if they had, uh, were happy with the hearing. They had followed the hearing quite correctly, and were quite happy to, um, to have been able to, uh, to, to use that, uh, that platform. So, uh, uh, again, public public access is 
is, is easy, but you need to ask for a, a number of the meeting and a password. Now, on the, on the, on the, on the case on problem of recording as well, in France, public record, hearing recording is, is forbidden in France. But how can you make sure that uh, nobody is recording during a video conference or a phone conference uh, hearing? That's difficult to, to, uh, to make sure. So um, uh, I have to say that uh, um, public access would be an issue in case of video conference, obviously. Thank you very much uh, for all that. The, the, the fourth and final topic is out of evidential issues. Um, Cross-examination, advocacy, documentation, etc. And I think Andrew from the US, Andrew Chamberlain, is going to kick off to tell us how this works stateside. Andrew. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I had a, uh, an opportunity about three years ago to uh, have a commercial trial in our commercial court in North Carolina that lasted about five weeks. And it was a paperless trial. There were thousands of exhibits, but uh, they were all done electronically. And I think that's a, a good guide for what we need to do. As, as I mentioned before, and as Tripp has mentioned, the individual response of state and federal courts has been largely a patchwork process. But if, if we have to continue to go forward uh, in this fashion in the United States, then uh, I have some observations for you. Uh, in, in large part based on my experience with the paperless trial. And, and that is, is uh, planning and communication with the court and your opposing counsel is critical. Um, there should be a pretrial exchange of exhibits. Uh, you should, so I'm gonna go through a list of 10 things you should consider. So number one, there, uh, the parties should exchange exhibits uh, pre-trial. Uh, second, if uh, the party should consider stipulating in advance to authenticity and admissibility to the extent that that is possible. To the extent that that is not possible, the parties in the court should consider a pre-trial hearing or a pre, you know, a, 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 a pre-event determination on authenticity and admissibility so that you could go forward either in your hearing, your bench trial, or your uh, jury trial if, if, if we are going to actually have uh, video jury trials in the future uh, so that that can go forward smoothly. To the extent that documents in their original form are necessary, or to the extent that you have to prepare for cross-examination, uh, or to the extent that it is important that the jurors be able to hold and possess the exhibits, uh, then uh, the parties should agree on the production of pretrial uh, exhibit notebooks that they can distribute either to the witness or to the jurors or to the court so that that can be uh, uh, those can be available to the people who need them. Uh, to the extent that those don't have to be in writing, uh, in, in paper format, uh, those can be placed in an electronic file used by the court, either through a Dropbox mechanism or through a SharePoint mechanism. Uh, it's Im important for the parties in the court to agree who's controlling the technology and who's providing it. Uh, in my particular trial, uh, the court did not have the technology available to do the uh, to do the trial, so the parties had to provide the technology, and they had uh, they had to reach an agreement as to who would manage the technology, how it would transition from party to party, as as the trial went forward, uh, and uh, there were also stipulations regarding uh, not making any inferences regarding who provided the technology for fear of, of biasing uh, the parties one way or another. Uh, you should also consider uh, an agreement on file formatting. Uh, you know, are, how are the documents going to be submitted? How are the videos going to be submitted if you're using that type of technology? Is this gonna be JPEG, MPEG, MP4? What type of format's going to be used that way 
you're not trying to uh, jump between formats for different types of exhibits. Uh, we've all been in trials where witnesses have prepared a chart or prepared a drawing or uh, created a document during the trial that is it, that becomes either demonstrative evidence or is actually admitted into evidence. Uh, so you, you need to have some agreement on the use of a platform for a in meeting file transfer so that whatever that's done can then be transmitted and recorded and preserved and become part of the record um, for the court. Uh, you also need to have a provision that you can have, for example, uh, bench conferences in the United in the United States. An issue that comes up in the courtroom uh, while the jury is still present uh, that the court needs to rule on privately. Uh, counsel will approach the bench, and and the court will have the court reporter come up, and all that will be recorded out of the sight and sound of the jury. Uh, if you're going to do this through technology, you need to have a, an, a, the ability to set a separate um, uh, room for that purpose. Uh, there are lots of other issues, uh, including oversized exhibits and recording the admission of exhibits, uh, but I want to keep us on track on time. So uh, I'll turn it back over uh, to our esteemed leaders. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, Ian, familiar issues in the UK? Yeah. Thank you, Duncan. So, so I approach this topic as a barrister who practices in cross-border personal injury claims and clinical negligence. So my experience comes from the county courts and the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court. Well, at least it was until lockdown. Uh, my diary has been considerably quieter for the last couple of months due to the adjournment of trials. Although I'm not going to moan too much, um, those at the criminal bar have had it much worse than uh, us at the civil bar. Um, so I'm going to focus on evidential issues from the perspective of closed courts to increased use of telephone hearings and the introduction of video hearings. Um, so um, some of my colleagues have been speaking about the issue of documentary evidence. Beforehand, generally in the county courts and the high courts, the norm was evidence by way of paper, huge numbers of lever arch files full of paper and uh, we'd all have to wade around the country carrying these documents. Well overnight we've had a complete change. Um, paper documentation have gone and we're moving on to e-bundles and that's principally because uh, the courts aren't wanting to receive paper bundles, uh, one party sending documents to the other, uh, there's just simply not the ability to uh, send and receive paper bundles now. Uh, so there's had to be a, a huge learning curve with regards to uh, working uh, paperlessly, using e-bundles, uh, working out how to um, uh, deal with um, PDFs. Um, so as Alex was saying, the courts have given specific directions with regards to what format those uh, e-bundles should take, but there are regional variations. So for example, there'll be consistency for, throughout the Queen's Bench Division in the High Court, uh, but regional the regional courts with designated civil judges all have their own practices uh, which can make uh, it um, difficult to know exactly what's required in one part of the country uh, to another and it really does emphasize the need for advanced preparation and coordination uh, between the parties as well as familiarizing yourself with using um, pdf documents uh, knowing what hyperlinks are uh, knowing how to use the uh, bookmarks and uh, alike. Um, generally speaking, in my experience, uh, e-bundles are working uh, perfectly well when uh, just lawyers and a judge are involved. Um, there are still, though, teething problems, uh, particularly in the county court. Uh, there are limited IT facilities and uh, not all law firms have the advanced um, technological resources that others do, uh, so that can cause um, some problems. Um, there can also be practical problems with the fact that a lot of court staff have been uh, working from home as well, uh, which presents practical difficulties sometimes in uh, these e-bundles actually reaching the judge. Um, I've certainly had experience when I'm starting off a hearing and we're, uh, we're going through uh, what everybody has that the judge will say, well, I, I just don't have that. So I routinely now will make sure I've got clean copies of PDFs uh, 
ready to go. Uh, so I can just simply ask the judge for their email address so they can be forwarded through. So we're working in a different world now where we can't just hand up a paper copy of a document um, to the judge and make sure we're all looking at the same thing. But there's going to be even greater problems with regards to documents and ensuring consistency with litigants in person, those being people who are acting without a lawyer, representing themselves, um, individual witnesses giving evidence, and um, who may not have the IT facilities or the printing capabilities uh, that lawyers uh, may well have. Uh, the second issue I wanted to touch upon is, is considering live evidence and cross-examination at a virtual hearing. Um, there's been two main uh, trends. The first has been the increased use of telephone hearings. Now, telephone hearings were used a lot uh, in the jurisdiction of England and Wales uh, pre-lockdown, but generally speaking, they were limited to hearings that would last no more than an hour. Now, that's changed. So uh, more complicated interlocutory applications, cost and case management conference, and even some more straightforward quantum assessments have now moved forward to telephone hearings. Um, there's then been the introduction of video hearings. So again, a uh, theme that's been uh, recurrent through this discussion is the suitability of IT facilities. And it can't simply be assumed that everybody will have those uh, facilities. Uh, the practical issues uh, will be uh, basic issues, which can often uh, cause a problem right at the beginning. If a witness wishes to um, give their evidence on oath, uh, but don't have a holy book to hand, um, that can instantly cause a problem. They may not wish to affirm. So that element of preparation needs to be considered for uh, giving evidence. Um, resources, uh, the quality of IT equipment. Does a witness have two devices? One upon which to look at the evidence, the second to follow the hearing. Um, and as I've already seen plenty of directions which says giving evidence just on a mobile phone is not going to be good enough. Um, there's also uh, a lot of here problems with internet connections. I've been told one tale of uh, one witness who didn't tell anybody that in fact he was using his mobile internet rather than a Wi-Fi internet and used up his allocation and uh, came to the end of the hearing and there was all sorts of panic while that was happening. Um, other basic issues. Um, I'm quite lucky. I've got a quiet room to work with at home. Um, a lot of my uh, clerks and my chambers don't have that. Equally, there's going to be plenty of people who have maybe a young family, young children, who are just not going to understand that they need to be quiet and left alone, for potentially a considerable period of time. Um, and there's also natural concerns about witness tampering, collusion and prompting, which exist when any kind of video evidence is being given. In terms of cross-examination, practical observations will be is that we have to take into account the time lag when it comes to video uh, evidence. Uh, reduced audio quality can also have an effect. I note in particular what Simon was saying about clients with hearing loss. A very significant issue is the loss of non-verbal communication and cues. Uh, it's particularly valuable to the bar and the bench in terms of appreciating how, how a witness is responding to a question. Is it spontaneously? Is it contrived? Does it appear to be honest? Does it appear as if they keep on looking to somebody else in the room for an answer? Um, there's clearly always risk of cross talking over each other, a problem that's familiar in telephone hearings. Um, and all the advice I keep on hearing is shorter, sharper, more succinct questions, greater preparation and coordination between the advocates and um, being prepared to take witnesses out of order. So for example, if one witness's audio quality uh, drops, it may be appropriate to move on to the next witness, something that would not usually happen for a trial um, being uh, in person. What cases aren't suitable? Uh, well, certainly I would consider the, the cases where, sorry, am I, am I overrunning? Just think it, yeah, please. Can you wrap up? Ah, yes. Um, qu issues with um, credibility and fraud, uh, translators, uh, vulnerable witnesses uh, um, are all, all issues where they probably wouldn't be appropriate. Thank you, Ian. Um, Mrs Justice Crawford, do you want to say a quick word? I will say it very, very quickly. And I'm just going to confine myself to the question of cross-examination. We have had experience of um, cross-examination cross in relation to fraud and through um, interpreters in the commercial court, and it has gone surprisingly well. 
um, issues as to witness tampering that can be dealt with by a strategically placed camera or by having a member of the opposite team at the place that the witness is. Um, I absolutely endorse what Ian has said about it is making people focus much, much harder on their cross-examination and cross-examinations are coming in shorter. Um, so that's in, in many ways a good thing. One big issue for witnesses has been the lack of hard copy documents. Many, many witnesses like to look at two documents at once, their witness statement, for example, and whatever they're being asked to look at, and that is making them very uncomfortable. And that is a real issue for witnesses doing themselves justice. Thank you very much. Monsieur Beast from from Paris. Yes, um, well, you might know that in, in, in France, we, uh, we don't practice the, the cross-examination as the, is, that's done in the UK and in the US. We have a way to restrict it and to control it. So I can't say that we've had any examples, although it's accepted to, to have, a, it's accepted, admitted to have cross-examination um, with, with uh, having witnesses and experts during the hearings. We don't do that uh, quite often. And I have no example of a case where we did it since the lockdown. I have to say, however, that uh, we are very close to our UK friends, uh, where um, obviously before mid-March, um, evidence uh, was uh, coming all the way through paper documents. And since uh, mid-March, uh, and, and our video conferences, uh, evidence is now coming elect electronically. And it's quite a, a great uh, step forward because uh, um, all lawyers have been used to it and uh, they have sent their um, e-bundles of documents uh, by mail um, uh, and myself I prepared my hearings with these uh, documents on my computer and I'm quite pleased not to have been forced to uh, to try to, to, to carry uh, kilo, kilos of documents paper documents anymore it's all stands on my computer I would say that it's quite a, a step forward and a, and a good, uh, good thing. Um, and I have to say that uh, in the case, I've had the two cases of unfair competition, I've received the samples by post, which is quite all right again. So um, again, the, um, to us, uh, there's no issue with the problem of evidence. Thank you very much. Um, Elodie, do you want to say a quick word before we move on to the plan of the future? Just a, just a few of them. Uh, what I may add is that the, the order I mentioned earlier on sets out that uh, communication between parties and with the jurisdiction uh, may occur by any means. Uh, it also states that in particular, electronic means are recommended and parties are invited to exchange their submission and documents by any means. So what should be pointed out and what uh, Christian Reyes just said is that the parties and of course their consuls have shown inventiveness. Uh, we have seen many judges or even court clerks communicate their direct email addresses in order to, to allow the communication of submissions and documents um, and even WhatsApp exchanges even occurs. So that's quite interesting. Thank you very much. Um, so the final part of this uh, webinar is to look at the future. What I'm going to try and do is combine that with some of the questions that have come up because we are running out of time. Um, we start off first of all with Jacques, and one of the questions Jacques has come in is, what do lawyers think about having to switch off their computers in August, the closing down of remote hearings, we heard from the, the French judges? Can you try and mute? Sorry, yeah, that's a real challenge for us. As a, as a judge, I've just said, um, the, 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 the COVID crisis represented a real challenge for lawyers, not for judges, but for lawyers. Um, and judges and, and, and litigators, uh, we had to carry on our practice from home. Um, we, we have experienced conduct of meetings with colleagues and clients by way of teleconference, video conference, such as Tixio, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and so on. And yes, Judge Wist, uh, 
it has probably been a challenge for lots of us, lots of lawyers. Uh, this has been a major leap forward. Uh, we reached something that a year ago uh, we thought would be our future. So now, what is coming next? Technologies have not have been used to uh, keep the justice system in operating during this crisis. What will remain after August? What part of the proceedings could be done through artificial intelligence and platforms? We have many uh, examples already of uh, the use of artificial intelligence in our in the courts or in our in our firms. Um, artificial intelligence can uh, analyze, can already analyze the quality of legal claim and evidence. AI can classify a case docket. Um, AI can uh, classify the chronolog chronological events in a case. Um, AI can predict judicial decisions and other outcomes of claims. AI can analyze the quality of claims and citations, read, analyze, and score submissions that lawyers make to the court. AI can provide case management, case management solutions. Uh, and AI, of course, and I know that's very uh, popular in, uh, in America, uh, can provide online dispute resolution platforms uh, and automated uh, decision making. AI can uh, provide platforms uh, as a support for litigators. Uh, in Paris, for instance, we have two uh, recent examples due to the, well, linked to the coronavirus crisis, which is one launched by the Paris Bar uh, to, uh, to provide uh, support litigators work um, before or outside the court systems. And uh, the Paris Bar has, uh, has launched two uh, complementary platforms uh, for mediation procedures. Uh, our organization, Paris Place de Droit, has uh, launched a, a, um, a platform uh, proposing the services of uh, conciliators uh, for amicable solutions for parties confronted with difficulties uh, related to COVID-19. So we have plenty of, uh, of examples of uh, the opportunities um, offered by, by uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the, the crisis has been uh, a kind of initiation for us um, to the many opportunities offered by artificial intelligence. And to uh, respond to your question, Duncan, I do not think their use will be uh, limited to uh, the pandemic times. No doubt that uh, artificial intelligence uh, is or will revolutionize the way disputes are resolved. Uh, AI powerful opportunities for research and analytics in the courts could improve the efficiency, the performance uh, of the courts and save costs, and therefore uh, probably improve the public uh, perception of the judicial system. Having said that, are we prepared to have a robot as a judge? Probably not. Uh, and this is a major challenge for the legal community. We have to identify the threats represented by algorithm. This question triggers many issues such as the neutrality of algorithms or the role of a human judge and a real trial in a courtroom, in a democracy. And Andrew, uh, you have uh, mentioned uh, the, the issues you are facing in, in the US with uh, uh, confidentiality and security of, of platforms. We know that uh, platforms and algorithms um, do not grant the, 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 the privacy of individuals sensitive information we know that so far, uh, platforms do not grant the transparency of uh, their tools. Uh, 
uh, who are what what are the algorithms used by the uh, by the uh, by the platform this is very important for for the parties to know so this is a a real a real challenge we have to face and uh, in europe i must say we have uh, we have a very interesting uh, soft law tool which is the the guideline adopted by the european commission for the efficiency of justice the cepej of the Council of Europe uh, that adopted in 2018 um, uh, guidelines uh, on artificial intelligence. Uh, it's pure software, but uh, it's interesting because they have, uh, they have uh, provided uh, what are the, the main um, principles relating to the use of artificial intelligence. And I'm sure that in the future, uh, we will probably pay more attention to these principles. Um, the first is the principle of uh, respect of fundamental rights. Uh, we have to ensure that uh, the design and implementation of the artificial intelligence tools are compatible with uh, fundamental rights. Uh, the second is the principle of non-discrimination. The third is the principle of quality and security. The fourth is the principle of uh, transparency, impartiality, and fairness. And the uh, last one is the principle of underuse control. Uh, the, the machine, the tool, must be under the control of a uh, human being, a uh, human judge. So with all these uh, principles, uh, I think we have uh, several guidelines uh, that uh, so far as of today do not correspond to, uh, to the law or to any kind of uh, convention, but uh, there are very interesting guidelines uh, provided by the soft law. Uh, and when I first heard about these guidelines two years ago, I thought this, this was kind of uh, for fiction, but now it's reality. reality. What we have heard today was precisely uh, the kind of, uh, of tools um, that, are, that are examined by the, by the CPEJ. And thank you for your attention, and I, I hope this will be use, useful for you in the, the use of artificial intelligence in the future. Thank you very much, Jacques. Um, view from the bench, Mrs. Justice Cocker, what does the future look like in the UK from the bench? Yes, yeah, well, I'll keep this pretty short because I have said quite a lot already this evening. I think it's been really interesting, the timeline. When we started, everybody was, this is all new, it's difficult, we hate it. And then as the problems have got sorted, there's been a sort of wild enthusiasm, which I think to an extent we're still living with, because there are lots of good things about remote hearings. There's less travel, remote clients from all around the world can watch. It's easier for the press when they want to interact with the law and they're understanding more about what we do. Hearings can go quicker because you don't have to get down the physical bundle and flick through. You can get quite a direct rapport between the advocate and the judge. Um, as Christian and Patrick were indicating, the hearings in remote, in administrative kinds of cases have been very, very good. Also, sometimes direct debating questions of law, you get a very, very good interaction. But getting past that, I think as we do more and more hearings, what we're seeing is that what we're getting is not better, it's not worse, it's different. And that's something we really need to take on board for the future. Um, obviously, we're going to be planning on the basis that we will want to keep some of what we're doing now, but how much? And I can very much see a case for having a default setting that certain case management under hearings under a certain length. So you've got no very knotty issues, they should go remote. I can see having quite a lot of non-witness determinations, short appeals, summary judgment applications, that sort of thing, staying remote. I can really see a case for keeping remote as an option for everything, if the parties are agreed. And I can see a much, a, a much greater use of video evidence than we have traditionally used. I think we've been challenged in what you can do on video and we've learned you can do more than we thought. But I do think we need to be really careful not to throw out the good of the live hearing um, when we are falling in love with remote hearings. There are concerns, especially from court users. So at a very early stage in the family division, 
we heard from a disaffected litigant who said, you know, the feel is all wrong. I don't feel I'm getting my fair hearing. It is set up like a video meeting and it feels more like a video meeting than a court hearing. You get those concerns from witnesses too. Some want the setup of a courtroom to emphasize their sincerity. Some teams are concerned that it's easier for witnesses to lie if they're not actually in court and not feeling the atmosphere. So we need to think a lot about which cases need court hearings. Not always the witness hearings, I think. Cases where you've got experts and enormous charts uh, that you need to go through. Cases where you've got very, very lively interaction between the bench and the bar, uh, where you want to be cross-questioning because over-speaking is really difficult. It's not ideal for appellate courts, both in terms of interventions and the collegiality. And we also need to think, and this is something Ian was saying, we need to think about the other things we really value about live hearing. Part of the experience of being in a trial is picking up the general body language. And that goes to so many things. It goes to really assessing a witness's evidence, yes. It goes to the kinds of issues to which a trip alluded, where the body language of the witness or the witness's response or the team of the witness's response can be very revelatory about how things are going. Sometimes you only know a witness has said something really dumb because of the way his team sort of puts their head in their hands. And there's also the aspect of how much for young lawyers of the learning experience is simply sucking up all of what is around you in court. And I think all of these things we need to bring into account when in months time, we try and draw those difficult lines about what are we gonna keep? And what do we need to go back to what we used to know? And I don't have an answer, but those are some of the questions, I think. Thank you very much for those insights. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, Amy, in the US, what does the future look like from the technology perspective? Thank you, Duncan. And I will be um, briefer than I planned in the interest of time uh, and participants. Um, but uh, I agree with Andrew and several other uh, people that have said that we're slow to change. And uh, once we do it, maybe we'll adapt to it. Um, as Madam Justice Hopper just said, um, sorry, my computer told me you couldn't hear me. Sorry. Um, that um, that what's, now that courts have adapted to this proceeding, perhaps they will continue to use it. And I think that's true in several courts in the United States who've already said, now that we have this technology in place, we are going to use it more often um, and use it in the future, maybe not all the time, but use it some. The uh, United States Federal Rules Committee for our federal system is also looking at the need for emergency rules um, for consistency the COVID crisis hit so quickly and courts reacted differently. So the federal system is looking to whether they need a uniform system of rules um, that would not be available till the earliest, the end of 2021. 20, uh, so it's a, a ways away. Um, I think we will see more um, ruling on the papers rather than have hearings in a lot of contested matters in the United States, as well as more arbitrations or bench trials. It takes longer to get a jury trial and that's going to be extended in the future uh, for civil cases in any event. Um, I uh, agree with Madam Justice that the body language is very important as Tripp said as well. I like to think that I have a better poker face than that when my witnesses say something stupid and they do, <laughs> uh, but I absolutely agree. And also I think there's an issue with watching the jurors and making sure they're paying attention. Um, I think all of us that have done a jury trial have seen a witness fall asleep or at least appear to fall asleep. If we're on a, a platform that you can't see them, that's a real problem. We don't know if they're paying attention to the evidence that you're getting a fair trial. So I had other things to say, uh, Duncan, but I appreciate, every, appreciate everyone's time and I think I will end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, well, all that remains for me to do is to thank everyone for a truly fascinating discussion. I apologize to attendees. We haven't had that much time to, to deal with questions. I try this moving going along. 
Um, but thanks very much to everyone. We've covered, I think, a huge amount of uh, ground. Uh, we've covered a lot of really interesting questions. It's been fascinating from a comparative perspective. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens over the next few months, as, as, as people have just said. So thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you to the IDC and the Commission Papi Lawn for having um, uh, helped us organise this. Um, and uh, thank you all to the attendees for having uh, joined us and participated, uh, li listened to this session on comparative law. And there's a thank you here from the British Institute. So thanks again to everyone and stay safe. Goodbye now.